Fell asleep and men are blind, can't recognize it's genocide Feel like the bomb about to drop out of the clouds Another virus going airborne, go hide inside your house Farmers watching crops die, they drying up with droughts Angry people forming crowds and trying to burn the cities down This is Armageddon, martial law for our protection I talked to God but it's long distance and I lost reception Forest fires and oil spills are the awful lessons I'm just waiting for the devil to take over heaven This is biblical, I swear it's in the Bible We keep killing one another and we dying for survival We used to fight for peace, we put our flowers in their rifles Now we're about to be extinct, every man, woman, if and child it's the end of the world, I will do better next time Oh yeah, I know it Yeah, I know it My fellow Americans, on this day, April the 25th of 2023 I address you as a member of We the People of these United States of America. I come to you to ask you when enough is enough. When will you stand up? We have been pawns in this game for far too long. The lying mainstream media, the botched elections, the collapse of our economy, and so much more. We have been brainwashed, conditioned, divided, and persecuted long enough. Today, I come to you and I say, have you had enough? Will you stand up? America needs her people. She is not okay. We are not okay. Thank you, Mr. Adams, Mr. Johnson. Hi, how are you guys doing? Uh, Senators. One of the things I wanted to bring up, first let me tell you who I am. Name's James Johnson, uh, co-founder of a group called E Pluribus Unum, and one of the leaders and spokesperson for the Ohio unorganized militia. I've spoken to many groups around Ohio and in other states and I've also helped start some groups. Now what I wanted to touch on was what Mr. Thompson said. I think he focused on a key point which was why these groups are forming. Why is it growing like it is? And that's some of the topics that need to be addressed and I think maybe you can talk to some people on the inside like you have here to answer those questions. To put it to you bluntly, some of the legislation that's being coming out of Washington, some of the executive actions that are taking place, ladies and gentlemen, these things started a revolution 200 years ago and got this country started. And the people are seeing this. The national news media and the actions of this government is some of the best recruitment we could have. We don't have to say much. All you have to do is talk to the, act, to the average person out there to tell you, how do you feel about your government? And the people you look at here, we're the calm ones. We're the ones that calm people down. Now, I'm speaking here as a representative for my state and other groups that I know of. The animosity that I see out there between the citizens, all of them, and the government is frightening. What they did was after listening to all these, all these abuses and government atrocities that you're going to hear here tonight, today, and they saw that they were going to no avail they decided to see what they could do to become part of the solution. They looked into the law and under Title 10 USC 311 saw a phenomenon known as the unorganized militia that consists of all people, even the people taking these pictures right here, everyone. And they began to form themselves in units for their own self-defense and their self-preservation. Now the way we stand now, and it's good that we're getting these views aired out, because 200 years ago, the British didn't get the hint until they saw dead redcoats out there. But this time, maybe we, maybe we can get this out in the open and have things resolved. Because I feel, and it's concerning to me, and I'm being sincerely honest, that with the increasing polarization between the tax-paying public out here and what goes on, not only in here, but certain state governments, that the only thing standing between some of the current legislation being contemplated and armed conflict is time. It's one of the reasons I got in this movement to help prevent that. Now you can see from the last two years of sales from the firearms producers in this country, this nation is probably one of the most heavily armed forces on earth. And I have heard more and more people say if one of these black-suited, armor-wearing, state-sponsored terrorists come kicking down my door, I'm going to blow somebody away. They don't call themselves militia. They don't even call themselves patriots. They call themselves American citizens who are getting tired of confiscatory tax rates, increasingly, legislation, increasingly heavy 
regulations which is they believe are leading them down a path to involuntary servitude. And one of the slogans that's been going around, especially in Ohio, is what I've been telling people for those who think that this is just primarily an angry white male movement, is that if our ancestors would have been armed, they would not have been slaves. That's why people are beginning armed. Not so much with firepower. That's not the thing that makes it dangerous. What makes it dangerous that they're being armed with knowledge? What you're going to see is a growing number of citizens, and you're saying that now, that's why we're here. Move away from the authority that is here, around, around the, in the Beltway, and begin to create their own constitutional authority. You're going to begin to see this in the resurgence of the common law courts. You're going to begin to receive this, and I'm going to summarize here, in the formation of the militias. That's what came first to defend ourselves. But you're also going to see this on the legislative end. You're going to see your own candidates in our own elections, and hopefully that we can become a system which will attract others into a constitu more constitutional based system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Day. The following statement will attempt to answer the question of the legitimacy and the need of the citizen militia. Not only does the Constitution specifically allow the formation of a federal army, it also recognizes the inherent right of the people to form militia. Further, it recognizes that the citizen and his personal armament are the foundation of the militia. The arming of the militia is not left to the state but to the citizen. However, should the state choose to arm its citizen militia, it is free to do so, bearing in mind that the Constitution is not a document limiting the citizen but rather limiting the power of government. But should the state fail to arm its citizen militia, the right of the people to keep and bear arms becomes the source of the guarantee that the state will not be found defenseless in the presence of a threat to its security. It makes no sense whatsoever to look to the Constitution of the United States or that of any state for permission to form a citizen militia, since logically the power to permit is also the, law, the power to deny. If brought to its logical conclusion in this case, government may deny the citizen the right to form a militia. If this were to happen, the state would assert itself as the principle of the contract, making the people the agents. Liberty then would depend on the state's grant of liberty. Such a concept is foreign to American thought. While the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution recognizes the existence of the state militia and recognizes their necessity for securing a free state, and while it also recognizes that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, the Second Amendment is not the source of the right to form a militia nor to keep and bear arms. Those rights existed in the states prior to the formation of the Federal Union. In fact, the right to form militia and to keep and bear arms existed, exists from in antiquity. The enumeration of those rights in the Constitution only underscores their natural occurrence and importance. According to the Tenth Amendment, ultimate power over the militia is not delegated to the federal government by the Constable. Consequently, the power of the militia remains in the hands of the people. Again, the fundamental fu function of the militia in society remains with the people. Therefore, the Second Amendment recognizes that the militia's existence and the security of the state rests ultimately in the people. Who, f who volunteer their persons to constitute the militia and their arms to supply its firepower. The primary defense of the state rests with the citizen militia bearing its own arms. Fundamentally, it is not the state that defends the people, but the people who defend the state. The second line of defense of the state consists of a statutory organization known as the National Guard. Whereas the National Guard is solely the creation of statutory law, the militia derives its existence from the inherent inalienable rights which existed before the Constitution and whose importance are such that they merit specific recognition in that document. While the National Guard came into existence as the result of legislative activity, the militia existed before there was a nation or a constitutional form of government. The militia consisting of people owning and bearing personal weapons is the very authority out of which the United States Constitution grew. This point must be emphasized. Neither the citizens' militia nor the citizens' private arsenal can be, appropriate, can be an appropriate subject of federal regulation. It was the armed militia of the, United, uh, the American colonies whose own efforts ultimately led to the establishment of the United States of America. While some may say that the right to keep and bear arms is granted in 
uh, to Americans by the Constitution, just the opposite is true. The federal government itself is the child of the armed citizen. We, the people, are the parent of the child we call government. You, senators, are part of the child that we, the people, gave life to. The increasing amount of federal encroachment into our lives indicates the need for parental correction, corrective action. In short, the federal government needs a good spanking to make it behave. On other important, one other important point needs to be made. Since the Constitution is the limiting document upon the government, the government cannot become greater than the granting power. It is the servant, it is, uh, that is, the servant cannot become greater than its master. Therefore, should the chief executive or other branch of government or all branches together act, act to suspend the Constitution under a rule of martial law, all power granted to government would be canceled and deferred back to the granting power, that is the people. And I'll conclude with this statement, martial law shall not be possible in this country as long as the people recognize the Bill of Rights as inalienable. My statement is not complete, however, it has been made part of the record. For Kimberly, this can't be accurate, right? The United States Supreme Court is hearing a case that could strip rights away from disabled Americans? Yes, it actually is true. The court decided to put on its docket for the term that begins in October a case that could really gut the Americans for Disabilities Act. If you recall, this was an act that was passed uh, with strong bipartisan support. But the way this act works is it's not just enforced by federal authorities, but also by individuals, individuals often with disabilities who bring suit against public accommodation businesses, things like hotels and restaurants, if they are not compliant with the ADA. Because the federal government can't be everywhere. And empowering individuals to enforce this act is often the only way that these businesses uh, adhere to the law. But what the court could decide is that these individuals don't have something called standing, meaning the right to bring these cases in court at all. I just watched History in the Making on the Republican House floor in Montana. Before I show you the absolute badassery, you need to know that Montana has been silencing a transgender lawmaker. For the last five days, Zoe Zephyr has not been allowed to speak on any bill proposed. And today, Montana's House was voting on a bill that would allow schools to out LGBT students to their parents. And when Zoe asked to be recognized, this happened. Mr. Chair, 63 representatives voted aye, 34 voted no. Really, a speaker has been upheld. The House Speaker sent riot police in to start arresting the constituents up in the stands. They cut off the mic so that you couldn't hear anything, but they made a bad choice in playing epic music while Zoe stood with her arm raised supporting her constituents. And yes, you heard me right. Police in riot gear arresting constituents for supporting their elected representative. I know that this bill sucks. They also passed a drag ban and both bills did pass. But by damn, it is badass to see constituents show up and stand for democracy. The one person in the legislature that can speak to the personal effects of these bans and they silence them and refuse to let her vote. But Montana's constituents are not having it. Listen to this constituent as he is dragged away by a police officer mid-interview with a news station. After that, the cops continue to come in, arresting people who would not move, who are continuing to chant, let her speak. And at the end of the day, uh, the people of Montana will not be silent. That's what it takes to stand up to fascism. They stood in the gallery knowing that they were going to be arrested, and they stood there anyways, because they stand for democracy and against fascism. Republicans have ignited an entire generation against them. And Gen Z has stated loud and clear, they will not be silenced. So good job to everyone that came out and supported Representative Zoe Zephyr. You guys are bad ass and you give me hope for our future. 
Chair recognizes the lady from Jefferson 43 for discussion of the matter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the lady yield to a question? She will yield. Does this bill label for the protection of children ban conversion therapy? Lady from Shelby. No. Lady from Jefferson 43. Will she yield to a second question? She will yield. Um, this country is built on parents being responsible for their children. In fact, truth be told, you don't even like your in-laws to tell you what to do with your kids. In this bill, are we substituting the opinions of legislators for the right to, for parents to raise their children? Lady from Shelby. Absolutely not. Parents have never had the right to subject their children to irreparable harm. Lady from Jefferson. May I speak on the bill? Yes, ma'am. I'm not even sure how we got here. But as a 27-year military veteran, I fought so that all people could have freedoms, not just the ones I liked. As an ordained minister, we preach, we teach all the time that God's decisions are perfect and that we're to go out and do what he asked us to do. Take care of the least of these, love above all, do the work for the people that need it. And now we're saying he's imperfect because we've got to fix it. We've got to insert our opinion on top of God's design. Don't tell me it's about irreparable harm because you're not doing anything for the children that are hungry. You're not doing anything for the children that are in foster care being abused. You're not doing what needs to be done for the little black kids that are experiencing racism every day. It is not for irreparable harm. It's because they are not like you. And as a mother, how dare you interfere with one of the most intimate relationships? This bill doesn't even do anything to say, well, I think the parenting is inadequate, so let me put some money and some time into parenting skills. This bill doesn't even say, what is the problem with parenting skills? It goes for the juggler to kill a nally and make sure that a whole group of people, who, by the way, is a small percentage, have no rights. Now, here's the good news. Go ahead and vote the way you like to vote. But if you don't stand for them, I promise you, they'll come for you. You don't like feeding your children oatmeal for breakfast? The government's going to tell you to do that. You don't want your child to go to the University of Louisville? The government could tell you to do that. We have no right to interfere in the parental rights. If you were really, really concerned about children, I could give you a hundred other things you could do to make sure that every kid in Kentucky thrives. Let's try giving them water out in the rural areas, portable water. Let's try Medicare, Medicaid, so they can go to the doctor. Let's try getting the kids off the street that are homeless and sleeping with snow as a blanket. I was born at night, but not last night. This is not about what you say it is. And if you want to be honest, just get ready for the invasion in your life. Because as I recall, a couple of months ago, you were saying the government can't tell me to wear a cloth mask to prevent a global pandemic. And now you're saying the government can tell a mother and a father what to do with their kid, and they don't have any right to opt out. Stop it. Sure,